Hello and welcome to All Around the Word at Imagine Festival 2021. Thank you for joining us on this Monday night and a special welcome to anyone joining us from the Noam Chomsky interview. Indeed, thank you to Noam Chomsky himself for being our opening act on the first night of this year's festival. My name is Colin Hazard and I have been involved with Imagine Festival for a number of years now. And it's always a pleasure to work with Peter O'Neill and the Imagine Festival team. And I'm very grateful for the opportunities that they always give for poetry and spoken word events. The mission of Imagine Festival is to provide high quality showcases for the discussion of contemporary political and so, so, well, The mission of Imagine Festival is to provide high quality showcases for the discussion of contemporary political and societal issues, including new ideas on politics, culture and activism. And this event is loosely themed around race and identity. Our readers tonight are some of the finest poets on this island, and they are Abby Oliveira, Elizabeth Bagion, and Nandi Jula. I'll introduce each of the poets just before their respective readings, but to get you warmed up, and because it's never easy to go first, I'll start with sharing one of my own poems. And I would like to dedicate this poem to the legendary entertainment promoter, Ronnie Purvis, who passed away in January this year, and who very kindly let me showcase the video for this poem at one of his music and poetry events in the Crescent Arts Centre a number of years ago. And this poem is called Foreign. I am foreign. I am an ice age white middle class male on the island of my birth and I am foreign. I am foreign because I do not understand the place I am living. In our collective minds misgiving we continue to make the same mistakes. Though the reasons have changed it remains the same. Same pain, same disdain, same arcane troubles of a society that is broken. With hearts unable to open, we exist in a culture of fear and search for someone to blame, which is easy when the media and powers that be are already pointing fingers, but we are only pawns in their game. I am foreign because I am afraid. I am foreign on one street but not another, and with this idiotic level of paranoia it is no wonder we attack each other. I speak the native tongue, but I am foreign. I speak the native tongue for daughters and sons who cannot fathom why these things are being done. I am foreign because you are taught to find a difference with me. We are fragments of a culture trained to see flaws in those who share our city, share our land and share our beds. There is no perfection. In the mirror, I see my reflection and I am foreign to the image in my head. To paraphrase the father of philosophy, Descartes, who coincidentally was French but spent most of his life in Holland, I think, therefore I am foreign. I am foreign because my lineage is from other lands from travellers who walked across great ice bridges until the ice on froze, the water level rose and our island was created some 10,000 years ago. I am foreign but familiar with irony. I hear people complain about immigrants when for centuries natives of the Emerald Isle travelled far and wide improving and creating life, aiding advancements in technology and design. They drew the first submarine the White House beams, and the two men at either end of that famous photo of construction workers having lunch atop a skyscraper were from Ireland. And I use Ireland in terms of the island, not to raise grievance or create some tired debate about national allegiance, yet to respect two other points of view which you may believe, Adam and Eve had no passport. And that fish which crawled from the sea and learned to walk on land had no enemies until borders were drawn by the hands of man. I am foreign, but I am confused. I am unsure if I am here for your jobs or your benefits. Perhaps if you believe the news, I am here for both. But if you believe the truth, I am far less likely to claim benefits or live in social housing than those whose lives I am said to be disrupting. I will make a contribution. I will enrich. I am more than your perception and more than a suitcase. I am foreign because I have a German watch, a South Korean phone, drive an American car, and my underwear was made in Taiwan. I had an Indian for my dinner and now I ask you to pardon my French when I say I'm a bloody foreigner and you're a bloody foreigner. Therefore, let's accept that we're all bloody foreigners. Stop judging people on race. Stop all the hate and let's try to get along. And then we can face up to the fact that we're all stuck here together on this lonely little rock that's just spinning in space. And now we move on. Thank you to the first poet of the evening, which is Abby Oliveira. Abby is a writer, performer, lyricist and theatre maker based in Derry. She has been an eminent member of the Irish spoken word scene for over a decade. She performs regularly at events and festivals throughout the UK, Ireland and abroad and has toured her work in Australia, New Zealand via support from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and Singapore. She has done commissions for BBC Radio 4 and BBC Radio Foil 
RTE Radio and many more. So please put your hands together and welcome Abby to the Imagine Festival Zoom stage. Hi, everybody. I want to just thank you for having me. And it is brilliant to be here with Elizabeth and Nandy. And thank you, Colin and Imagine Festival. Um, yeah, so I'll just kick off. I'll start with um, this poem called American Candy. And it's just about violence, really. And all the ways that it manifests and drives us. Oh, we know violence. Sure didn't it nurture us like pups? Insisted our mothers give birth to us prostrate and in stirrups. Oh, we know violence. Sure it slapped our arses into existence. Gifted our first and last breaths. It spoke in tongues when it taught us right from wrong in a thousand different languages. When all we knew was one, it was violence. Forbade us from pointing our fingers at what we couldn't understand or at the ones who stand accused it saved the shame of our mothers taught some of us that pointing fingers could be guns or magic wands violence sometimes sings lullabies instead of rebel songs wakes us up to a chorus of bombs and sends us out to war in the digital morning hands on heart Hand on hearts to sing a song of subservience with nothing but the exaltation of the city of London in our souls or Israel, Vatican, Washington, Zion. It's hand on hearts to sing a song of subservience. Oh, we know violence. From the threadbare fabric of our fashion house homes to the sexy shells of Stockholm syndrome. From our violent psychopathic representatives to images of kids without pet limbs to pick the American candy up off the street with. Oh, we know violence. Every time we try to speak our native languages, every time we realize entire sections of our blood have been spattered to the four corners of some mythical land called Diaspora. Every time a girl has to leave this city because she was raped by great connected men. Every time Jimmy tells me that story of being forcibly sedated and waking in another country entirely. Every time I think I might best use my clenched fist to salute rather than break heads, I can feel the violence that I am breathing down my neck. Oh, I know violence. We know everything there ever was to know about violence. But when they cast the final die, how many of us are going to know how to fight? Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I was thinking about the concept of identity and um, sort of how we mould our identities and how we create those identities. And then a friend and I got into talking about the idea that, you know, that we strive so much to be unique. And yet because of the culture, the, the sort of corporate culture that we're steeped in, we inadvertently sort of develop our identities through that sort of corporate lens. So I wrote this piece called branded and really I constructed it entirely out of corporate slogans you know I thought if I could try and get some meaning from the corporate slogans alone so yeah branded I think different and I'm loving it I'm loving it because I'm worth it I'm worth it because I just do it I do it because I was born with it I'm trusted to deliver excellence I'm one of the miracles of science, where vision gets built to high standards, low prices, a virtual world of live pictures. I never leave home without it. I do what tastes right by my uncommon wisdom. Expect great things. Expect great things. I'm setting the standards. One world, one vision, beyond petroleum, beyond petroleum. I am life more interesting. A loaf of bread in every arm for your precious moments. I cover the earth in the spirit of service until everyone comes home. Until everyone comes home. Are you listening, big brother? I am where it all comes together. The one and only unique expression of the almighty. There is no substitute, surely. Pick me. Pick me. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, it's so weird doing this, you know, when you can't hear or see anybody but yourself, but soldier on, we will. Um, 
the next one I'm going to do is called The Trees of Potomkin Island. And I wrote this after the Grenfell Tower disaster. What I imagine just that, what that burnt out shell of a building might see if it spoke. Am I gorgeous enough for you now? Look at how I wear this brand new dress. Does it not just scream elegance? Even in this blackest of charcoal black, am I still not business class? Can't you see through this side split? These sultry stairways to heaven smelt at the hearts of clouds as they dreamt, scattered their ashes over the rose gardens of Kensington. Have I not stood up as straight as any national monument? Though sick with the woes of unsung ghosts who taught me the words for mercy in so many different tongues, I choked to death. When will they declare the national day of mourning? Haven't thousands turned out to mourn to cover this final restless place in bouquets like royalty? Doesn't the horse guards parade and King Felipe's visit look a vulgar ticker tape pageant next to this striking silhouette? Sight of human sacrifice, cenotaph to facades. Well, I say woe. Woe to those whose greatest sorrow is sore eye. Who could not bear to look the day they dare not look away from me? The iconic burning tower. The consequences of past actions cause great conflagrations. The trees of Potomkin Island bear poisonous fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, so if, if you like what you hear and you want to connect online or anything, you can find me on Facebook or my website's abbyolivera.com. Um, yeah, this next one I will do is called Hole. And I wrote it about the border. I thought I'd have to saw myself in half to stand in two countries at once, says the Wayne, jumping state ropes on the border back road. But I'm still whole. Arms outstretched as if tied to a rack, she says. We're holding hands, me, Donegal and Derry. There's no here or there for her yet. No euro, sterling, foreigner, citizen, trouble, peace, president, queen, ally, enemy. She is the flock of Brent geese breaking for inch. Should I have pointed out that invisible line? told her to imagine a fat sleeping snake only old people can see. 310 miles from forked tongue to rattling tail. Belly harrowing through water, concrete, grass, stone, hearts, brains, danger houses, home. Should I pretend this snake won't bite? All borders draw blood. The pen is the master of the sword. One too young day, she will be old enough to see. Walls are only necessary till imaginations harden. By then, she'll have sawn herself in halves, quarters and acres, a thousand times over, and will still be whole. Thanks very much. And I'll finish up with this piece called Laura, this poem called Laura. And um, if you have grown up in a small town and you're mixed race or black or you know and you've broke up grown up in a small town that's predominantly white um you might you might empathize with the situation here laura oh yes laura what about you I had no idea you were working here. Where's all your colours at the day? You're a big grey of rainbows usually. Laura, how's your mammy? Tell her I was asking for her, won't you? I'm lighting candles every day. Laura, let me hold your hand. I seen that documentary last week. I understand why you came here. And did you see the news, Laura? The Mediterranean? All them poor people drowning. Sure you wouldn't get out your bed of a day if you thought about it too much. Anyway, 
Laura, are you still at the baking? Did you ever get into that catering college? You're looking wild pale today, Laura, are you sick? Laura, you won't remember me. I used to babysit you when you were tiny. I taught you how to save fuck off. Your granny near killed me. Your granny near killed me. I have a granddaughter now, did I say? She's just like you. Laura, I saw that daddy of yours in the pub. You'd hardly miss him right enough. Ha ha, sure we all bleed red blood. And didn't I tell your mum when they split up? You couldn't trust them. There was just something about them. Their reputation precedes them, you get me? Laura, I remember what you and your sisters endured. I mind hearing about you slicing your face with a razor because you didn't want to be the hairy girl, huh? That was why. Laura, you should go for a checkup. You're half the woman you used to be. You'd be susceptible to this virus too, apparently. Maybe that's, and don't take this the wrong way, please. Maybe that's why you're having trouble conceiving. Tell me this, Laura. Does your sister with the poker straight hair still take her wee tablet? God luck to her, she could have been a model in Paris. Anyway, Laura, I must run on here. Mind tell your mammy I was asking for her, eh? We've not seen each other in decades, but sure, if she fancies a coffee. I know everything about Laura. But I am not Laura. Laura and I have never met. But I'm willing to bet we're nothing alike. Not in height, nor build, personality, nor accent, history, nor story, ethnicity, nor temperament. Yet somehow, I am 110% certain that Laura is mixed race with an Afro. Thank you all very much. Hand you back to Colin now. Thanks for having me, Imagine Festival. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Abby. From America to Grenfell to the border to the small town, that was really powerful poetry there. Thank you for, for joining us and sharing your words. Uh, our next poet is Elizabeth McGowan. Elizabeth is from Belfast and she is a Pushcart Prize nominee and has featured in publications including Banshee, Abridged and Rigwelter. As a spoken word artist, she was winner of the 2019 Cursed Murphy Spoken Word Prize, the 2019 Kurt Literary, Fest Literary Festival Spoken Word Platform and has been a finalist in the All-Ireland Poetry Slam and represented Northern Ireland at the 2019 Hammer and Tongue UK Slam Finals in the Royal Albert Hall, no less. That's quite a 2019 you had. Elizabeth has also featured at festivals and events, including Body and Soul, Loud Poets, Electric Picnic, Sonnet Youth, and as a regular cast member in Other Voices Alternative Spoken Word Cabaret at the Edinburgh Fringe. She has received funding from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and the National Lottery to work on her first full-length spoken word show. And I'm delighted that she's here to share a selection of her prize-winning poems. So please show some Zoom love to Elizabeth McGowan. Hello to everyone at the Imagine Festival and thanks to Colin and Peter for inviting me to take part in this tonight. Um, it's a strange old festival as they all have been this year. We've all been online, we've all been getting used to Zoom and live streaming. And this first piece I wrote about live streaming and how it can help access and help even the playing field but also hinder it in some ways. Once upon a time, a plague came. This plague was strong and swift and smart. It could find the chinks in armor. It was born aloft in air. People began to stay in their houses, some houses large, some tiny as bird boxes. And those people in their bird boxes found they needed others, so they began to reach out across oceans, across time zones. They would speak words to each other. The world map became a spider web of links fostered and cultivated in these boxes. On the map, though, there were black spots, dead spaces, haunted house, icy drafts where no words were spoken. The largest collection of these dead spaces together was a blot on the map and this blot had a name. It was simply called City. City was self-contained. City was self-sufficient. City was self-sustaining. City was self-ish. City made a decision that they would 
wait until this all blows over, until things return to normal, until they could preserve the integrity of the space and the art form. Their gleaming skyscrapers and business suits, their slick, sharp syllables and upwardly mobile lifestyles would protect them from the virus. What they really needed to be protected from was interlopers. What these interlopers looked like, City could not be sure of. They might perhaps have long noses, dark skin. They might be ancient and withered, and City could not bear those who were not aesthetically pleasing. They might stumble over words, not create clean lines. They might squeeze or shrink words, constrain consonants, and be rural in accent and outlook. City, above all else, cannot abide. A rural outlook cannot bear anything regional. They might limp, exhibit deformities, or be mentally deficient. They might require City to slow and wait for them, and City never slows. You must remember that City is not a location. City is a state of mind. City saw the bird boxers, the communicators, as outcasts. Of course, they were outcasts. Why else would they need so desperately to communicate with people outside themselves? City's communication was all internal, smoothly humming along an oiled mechanism. City knew what City was thinking before City even realized it's itself. Bird boxers held up clumsy cups to walls, listened as words filtered along strings and were excited. Excited, City despaired, really such base indignity to hear what the other person would have to say. Sometimes this communication failed. The string broke, the cup became clogged, language barriers babel. This Chinese whispering only served to add to the excitement of the bird boxers though. They would giggle at the glitches. They were sure this communication would help them if they just tried harder, if they just tried again, moving their cup around the room in search of that most mysterious of gods, the phi of why. They bared their souls in bedrooms, empty pizza boxes and spreading damp on ceilings to eyes who did not judge because they had the same. He will see your rising damp and raise you a landline, a dial up connection, a neighbor's barking dog. And it gradually emerged in these whispered conversations that people were beginning to forget about city. They had visited once as a child stood and watched the Christmas lights in the toy store window and got the bus home drunk on crowds and magic. A school trip, maybe as a teen to a gallery, the boys would snigger at the paintings of the tits, out birds. City was not and never had been a part of their lives. City did not reach out, so they stopped reaching in. They reached for each other instead. Um, so this event is very much about race and identity. And I wrote this poem several years ago, thinking about uh, identity as a Northern Irish person and how conflicted that can be, especially when you meet people in the wider UK and you have these conversations about things you didn't realize were weird, like, oh, you didn't get searched going into shops as a child. That's, that's interesting um, and slightly more interesting when you're in a situation that I am when I was brought up uh, being the child of a, one Catholic and one Protestant, which you don't talk about. In Northern Ireland, there are things you don't talk about. In the 1960s, people learned the hard way to stop Silenced in the 70s with a bit of jail time if you didn't comply, unlike the 80s when they wouldn't stop talking so much, they were reduced to mime, a crime to be heard, absurdly dubbed the 90s. When talking turned to singing, they pretended to hold hands and teach the world to sing. Somewhere in the middle of all this, I appeared. Maybe I absorbed it in the womb, absorbed the whispers and the bin lid rattles like I absorbed my mother's nutrients, like they absorbed their own nutrients from their fat and muscle and bone marrow until nothing was left. It took him 66 days to absorb himself, and I think in the womb I heard it. I'm made of it. McGeones only last 42 days before their family take them off strike for health reasons. You can't die as it'll make you sick, as only a McGeon can manage to fuck up dying. I am your red right hand. I am this 
divided land. I didn't realize Zombie by the Cranberries was about Northern Ireland as everyone has their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns, don't they? Memory. A fire was just a fire and I laughed because I didn't know why there was a guy on the top as that was 5th of November. Remember, remember, I read it in books. My mum hushes me saying she'll explain later, not wanting the neighbours to know I don't know it's the Pope because I was sheltered from all this living in interdenominational bliss, never heard the sash, don't know it when people ask me to sing as I live in a bubble, in a bubble and I am your red right hand, I am this divided land, came up the lagging, up the lagging in a bubble, in a protective bubble in my protected Protestant school while McGeones were dropping like flies around me all warm and safe, safe for the glowing neon surname attached to my forehead. No one ever spoke of it. Francis Felix became Frank, became anglicised, Franklincised, and I never wondered why he didn't come with us to see the band. And a Catholic taxi driver shot dead. This is what the news is for to tell you who's been shot. I didn't even understand half the words, but can still hear them now with a kind of muscle memory. Secretary of State, Tom King, Patrick Mayhew, Tom King, Patrick Mayhew, paramilitary shooting, kneecapped, found dead, found dead, shot dead. This is what the news is for to tell you who is dead. We didn't take the soup, he said, but people keep force feeding me, force feeding me, McGeown. McGowan? McGeown. McGeown? McGeown. McGeown, 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 I am your red right hand, I am this divided land word association. Burnt out car, car bomb, petrol bomb, bomb scare, bomb scare, bomb scare, castle court, bomb damage, fire damage, seal. I never wondered why so many places were on fire. Some were a fire more often than not, which led to cheap school uniforms. Memory. In the library, made some friends and I can pinpoint the exact moment. Are you a Protestant or a Catholic? And time stops. More words from the news, the news to tell you who is dead, Protestant and Catholic, and I resolved to find out what they mean when I go home, should I have been listening all along? I am your red right hand, I am this divided land. I take pieces of evidence out and examine them. What exactly are people doing to each other's kneecaps? Why do the orange men carry swords? Why are they so unhappy? What if their sword slips a secret fear? Every year I edge away from the spikes, a gray spot on a happy day. Is it a happy day? And a Catholic taxi driver shot dead. This is what the news is for to tell you who's been shot. I didn't even understand half the words, but can still hear them now with a kind of muscle memory. Secretary of State, Tom King, Patrick Mayhew, Tom King, Patrick Mayhew, paramilitary shooting, kneecapped, found dead, found dead, shot dead. This is what the news is for to tell you who is dead. I am your red right hand. I am this divided land, derided man, black and tan, home rule plan, balaclava football fan, also ran, weapons ban, kick in the can, I'll tell me ma. I am this divided land. Thank you everyone for listening. Oh, I have a little smudge on my nose, but that's okay. The magical world of Zoom. I'm going to do one more piece um, tonight. And I wrote this quite recently um, about something I read on the internet, on the Twitters. Uh, and it kind of goes into how things that happened when you were a child can affect you. Um, child poverty, food insecurity. But basically what happened in early January on Twitter is that a man went viral because his daughter asked him if he could make some food because she was hungry. Um, there was only one can of beans in the house. She didn't know how to use a can opener. And he said, if he taught her how to use a can opener, that would make her lazy. So she would have to figure it out by herself. Um, this took six hours. Uh, and he, he live tweeted the experience in not the nicest way. So I wrote this to that lovely man to the bean man, to the bean man with a daughter, to the bean man with a hungry daughter and hungry should be the most important word in that sentence. Bean man, we have never met, but bean man, you are my father. Bean man, you are too young to be my father, but you are him regardless. Bean man, you went viral on Twitter. Bean man, you played a game. 
Bean man, you spotted a learning opportunity. Bean man, you have a hungry daughter, but she cannot intuit. Her brain is fuzzy. You cannot be proud of this one, but she will make some people laugh on the internet. That is enough. Remind her of the value of a good bean, the flavor she cannot currently access. Talk to her of tasty treats and she will salivate or cry. Whichever it is, water will leak from her female body in some way. She is always somehow leaking something. Words, emotions, strength. Place the final piece of your jigsaw puzzle home six hours later, which is conveniently nearly dinner time, as she correctly latches the opener onto the can ring. Bean man, you call yourself Apocalypse Dad. Bean man, they call you Bean Dad, but I am not sure you deserve that title. The Stanford marshmallow experiment gave children a choice. One marshmallow now or two later. They found that children of lesser intelligence accepted one marshmallow now because they had no long-term vision, no plans, no understanding of anticipation, no patience, and these children of lesser intelligence let us not beat around the bush these stupid children were often from low-income families because stupidity recreates itself and poverty is a punishment. Those who can wait and delay, work harder, shine brighter, last longer, can you resist the marshmallow? Who is your daddy and what does he do? Is the promised extra marshmallow a treat or are you hungry? Or is your dad a bean man? Does he laugh and later? Later, does he promise not deliver? Does he make you earn your prizes with an ever-changing template and some ever-moving goalposts? Will he eat your next marshmallow? Will he eat all the marshmallows? What will you eat? When will you eat? Do you want second marshmallow as a treat? The scientists had not calculated for reliability and trust. For the dogs who salivated at the ringing of the bell, for the bowls that were left empty, for the kids who cannot tell if there's enough food in their pantry as they're told to keep it zipped, who will grow and thrive regardless of being told they'll get their wings clipped, but it's a mindset that stays with you and you take outside the home enough that when you meet a scientist and he asks with kindly tone, would you like one marshmallow now or two later? Just take what you can get because adults often lie and adults often disappear and adults sometimes die. That rumored second sweetie could be truthful, could be trick, and you've been taught by your upbringing that too many make you sick, but also none is very possible. None's the only guarantee. So if you only see one sweetie, grab it now. Grab while it's free to the bean man. It's not that you were trying to educate a growing mind, it's that you did so in the ways that could be called unkind. There are ways to teach a child the things worth learning, teach their mind to sing, and there are ways to bring a child to fear and hate. You bring a child to tears and make the child remember it. So when you're trying to teach them grit and determination, think on this. Your hungry daughter spent six hours crying, trying to open a tin of beans and didn't intervene. She tried for that long, not because you taught her perseverance for the learning of the skill, but because you said neither of you would eat anything until she succeeded. One marshmallow now or two later? The beans in the hand or the two in the bush, and she believed that you were capable of disappearing. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing those words with us. And our final reader is Nandi Jula. Nandi's work has been showcased. Nandi's, I'll try that again. <clears throat> Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing those poems with us. And our final reader is Nandi Jula. Nandi's work has been showcased at the Dunkern Arts Centre in North Belfast, Go Team Dunkern, in Armagh at the John Hewitt International Summer School and the John O'Connor Writing Festival. Her work reflects both her origins as an African artist and as someone bedded into the culture in Northern Ireland. Nandi Jola Project managed the Home Near the Here Nor There exhibition at Stormont to mark Africa Week in May 2013. And Nandi is one of the leading artistic presences in the African community here in Northern Ireland, taking a prominent role as an arts voice and presence in the ongoing Black Lives Matter campaign. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nandi to the Imagine Festival Zoom stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Imagine Festival. And thank you to yourself, Colin. Thank you to Abby and thanks to Elizabeth. Beautiful work. I'm just gonna start with a lament, a prayer. I'm gonna call on a ritual for this land. Let us give love a chance to give our children hope of a world without hatred, 
where black and white walk hand in hand. Let the peace walls come down so that the ghost of apartheid can be finally laid to rest for history to remain history only to be found in books on shelves. Together, let us dance to freedom and emancipate to one song for we are one race of many colors, but one unity, one heart, a tapestry of love. I'm gonna read my daughter's poem, which is called I Cry for Humanity. Last night, I cried for humanity, staring at baby photos wet with my own tears. I wish I could still like that. I wish that when I looked at the world, I saw kindness and starlight and sunset and love. I wish that someone would have told me about this world because if I had known, I would have kept my eyes closed. If I kept my eyes closed, I would never cry. I wouldn't cry in the streets watching the homeless man slip from my hands. I wouldn't cry at the school gate watching the children rip away at heart. I wouldn't cry at the foot of the church while they preach love at me but hatefully. For they say God is love but not if you are gay. Where they say love thy neighbor unless they are Catholic where they remind me that I came from Adam's rib, but forget to mention that one day he will come from my womb. Unless I don't want him to, unless I don't want to be torn from inside by a man who will one day grow to hate me or just someone who looks like me. I refuse to raise a son that looks at a woman but does not see me in her reflection because what if that was me? Like how so many times that has been me. I refuse to be the son who was born to die. I refuse to take another bullet from another officer's pistol. I will not watch him walk out the door for the last time, every time, except I will, because to you, my refusal is nothing like my body. You'd rather I keep it silent, keep my mouth closed and my words folded into a box in the back pocket because black is beautiful, but not on me because my blackness is not for me. My blackness is your exhibition, my hair, your national treasure, my skin, the world's thickest, kun, as thickest pin cushion that you will not pierce. And as I stand here looking up at the glass ceiling that I will never see, I cry for humanity. I cry for a world that will never love me or any other little black girl. Instead of loving me, the world will rub my face in the mud. Stand up and smile. Good, he will say. Now you have found what you deserve. Thank you. And I'm gonna uh, read my poem now, uh, which is called, I think Abby will be <laughs> familiar with this feeling. Um, my daughter grew up in the girls brigade and uh, I remember getting notes even from school. If she, it was a swim, uh, swimming day, uh, asking that the head be tied up nice and neat. And sometimes uh, be put up in, with a white ribbon on. And I love looking at these um, notes and thinking, you know, have they not seen that my child is black? That will never happen. And um, just to give her maybe an extra 10 minutes to dry her hair would do it rather than embarrassing her for soaking herself on the way back 
uh, from the swimmers. So this one is called hair. And for this one, I'd like to take my head off and dedicate it to the hair. <laughs> so hair. Not a single day goes by without someone patting my hair. I mean, hands on. I explain to those close to me that my hair is attached to my head, which is attached to my neck, which forms part of my body. Yet no matter how many times I explain this, my sheepish looks attracts more hands. <laughs> it sparks a debate about identity, intolerance, and difference. My friends can't come to terms with that word black. And yet they choose to settle for something like dark-skinned or tan. That's bringing their ignorance to my history and my struggle. It seems like I don't like my hair at first because it's ritualistic. My hair is an embrace. It is a solidarity. It is a history. But most of all, it's about reclaiming. My hair is a symbol. It is a statement. And more young girls and girls and boys shout, don't shoot the more my hair becomes entangled in this liberation struggle. My hair is my liberation flag in these streets. Being the only black child at my school, it is my defiance. At the eyes that look at me with hate, my hair, my confidence, my root, my decolonization. Angela Davis and other women of history wore theirs with pride. My hair was not built to be hidden under a wig or a weave. It was built to be seen. It demands to be seen. It shouts to be seen because my hair says Black Lives Matter. Thank you. And um, <laughs> the hair comes back, back on again. So I'm going to read uh, the last poem. And again, I wanted to read my daughter's poem, and this is dedicated to all the black girls that grew up in Northern Ireland and um, not knowing whether they were brown, black, and wanted to fit in. And I just want to say to them, you know, you are black. Black girl magic. Pocket of starlight glowing brighter than a full moon. You, little black girl, you are magic. Like hidden treasure, you are the gold dust beneath the coal. They tried to bury you, tried to make you something lost, but you cannot be lost. The smoothness of you melts over sorrows like honey. They tried to bitter the sweetness of you. You will not lose your taste, black girl, because you are magic. Like a bird's first whistle, you are the melody behind the song. The beauty of you needs no mirror to be seen. They tried to hide you under a mountain of glimmering pearls, but like a lighthouse, you demand to be seen because you are magic. When they knock down your door, do not cry. Instead, thank them for showing you to the world. When they burn you at the stake, do not scream. Instead, thank them for lighting someone else's spark. Never let them take your heart, little black girl, because you are magic. The brightness of you, the melody of you, the beauty of you, all of you is magic. It's your magic. It's black girl magic. Thank you. Thank you, Nandi, for those very powerful words there, and indeed for showing off your hair and your fabulous earrings. And I could share a, a poem about my own hair, but it would be a very short poem as well. So um, thank you again. Um, Nandi is actually part of two more events at Imagine Festival, which are Letters with Wings, where art meets activism, and as part of a Q&A, which follows the screening of Ballet Black short film, Like Water. Both of those events are happening on Sunday, the 28th of March, and you can check Imagine Festival website for details and tickets, of course, for both of those. One more event I should plug is the Duncurrent podcast video recording, which is happening on Wednesday at six o'clock. As the Duncurrent's writer in residence, I will be hosting that with uh, an artist, Kieran Harper, and the poet Raquel McKee. 
So if you can, please join us on Wednesday from six, six o'clock and tickets for that are free. So we can't go wrong. The price is right. The price is perfect, actually. Uh, all that's left for, not, for now is for me to thank once again Peter O'Neill and Imagine Festival to Accidental Theatre for hosting the event. And of course, thank you to all the audience for watching. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all our readers for their thought-provoking and inspiring poems. And if I can borrow a line from one of Nandi's, I think it was Nandi's first poem, it's been a tapestry of love and poetry. So thank you, Abby. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Nandi. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the Imagine Festival. Mm -hmm.